How we doing everybody? Here for the second half of our weekly lecture here on week two. Um, one of the things I was thinking about last week is I had printed out all your nuggets and questions and when I did the video I was kind of shuffling papers around and all like this. And that didn't work out all that well. So when I was rethinking it for this week what I decided to do was kind of cut and paste all your questions into one document but also have that document on the screen so you can see what I'm reading and how I respond to it. And at the same time I think this is there's less error for me in case I miss something because I may have missed some questions last week by the way I was shuffling all the papers around and that may not have been optimal. So let me let me go a little bigger here. So the first article we have, you know, we, we're starting off with our first article, why satisfied customers defect, you know. Questions. How does a company attract the wrong customer? Well, hold that thought. Shouldn't a company strive to obtain different customers with their products or customers that will cross over? Now, I'm going to agree with the second half of the sentence. You know, the best customer base in a CRM philosophy that we're going to get to our next two weeks of reading starting next week, the best customers are one that you can sell product A to, develop a relationship with, and then sell additional different products to them, product B or product C. Or you sell product A to them, but then you're able to sell service package B to them. You know, that's the best kind of scenario. How does a company attract the wrong customer? Well, it could be a situation where if you're getting pressure from upper management saying, we, we need more revenue, we need more revenue, we need more revenue, you guys might let in customers that are not worth it, but you just need the revenue for now. They might not be worth the time, the effort, the money. They may be small fries. They're not big fish. Or they're not in the industry that is your strength, but you wanted the revenue stream, so you're only weekly taking care of them you know it's usually internal pressures why you would go after the wrong customer the only other scenario that I would say to this is that perhaps the company makes a strategic shift and all of a sudden you know you wanted to focus or you wanted to go into a different area a different business or a different product line and all of a sudden you have all these other customers that you no longer want anymore maybe you sell that division off isn't it bad for a business to perf purposely try to rid product or a particular customer or a particular customer segment? Well, you're going to see in these articles this week and the articles we're going to read the next two weeks, they keep talking about firing your customers. And I'm going to tell you right now that in actual practice, it rarely happens. It really doesn't happen all that much. The most common thing is instead of firing your customers, companies do one or two things. They make it more difficult for the customer to do business with you, therefore the customer just drops out, out of attrition, or the company sells that particular division off. You know, A perfect example is, is when I was a poor doctoral student, You know, I needed a bank account, but I got a free checking account, and they told me explicitly, you know, if you ever walk into the bank and go up to a teller, we're going to charge you eight bucks. I was like, you got to be kidding me. But they're purposely sending me a signal that I'm not worth their time. Yes, they want my money in the checking account, but because it isn't all that much, they're not going to make it any more easier for me to do business with them. All right. How do you avoid bad customers or those you will never be happy? Well, that, that is a good question. Is it wise to actually discourage anyone from buying your product? I think it is wise to actually discourage people from buying your product. Your product should target a particular segment or a particular individual and not everyone. And as long as the people understand the what's in it for them, the W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for them, is a fit for their needs and that's what my product is a strength for, then there's a fit. You know, going after all customers and saying all possible things, you know, here, buy this computer. It may not be a perfect fit for you, but buy it anyway. Well, that customer might not be happy. You know, it's better not to go after that extra business. 
What offerings that customers get on price and not what about the offerings that customers get on price and not value? There are plenty of successful target. How do you keep customers loyal when your product and services are not are not extraordinary? Okay. You know, Target is a perfect example that we're looking at value and not price. You ever notice that with Target advertising, they never advertise price? Think about every TV Target ad you've ever seen. Do they ever emphasize price? But every Walmart TV ad you see always emphasizes price. The rolling back, the little smiley face bouncing over things, you know. So, you know, if you're always targeting on price, you know, you have a harder time because the, the only people, you know, the only time customers are coming in is because you have the low, you know, like a dollar store. You're going in because it's a dollar store. That is the value, low price. You know, there's some people when you go into a Tiffany's, the value is quality. It happens to be higher price. You know, as long as I think the answer to the question, as long as you're explicitly clear to your customers what you are, I mean, walking into one store and the store is signaling you quality, yet the price is really low, and then it turns out that the quality is not there, there's a disconnect. If you're signaling high price, high quality, and it's clearly high price and high quality, then there's not an issue. How do you keep your customers loyal when your product and services by design are not extraordinary? Well, there could be other things you could do. I mean, not that I'm a I'm a fan of forced loyalty, but you know, you could have some kind of uh, breakup clauses. You could have some kind of things like that in the service contracts. You could also do things that, you know, think of Bed Bath and Beyond. Do you ever walk into Bed Bath & Beyond without a coupon? Do you ever walk into Macy's without a coupon? And even sometimes you go into Macy's and you don't have your coupon, the people at the register will like pull the newspaper out and kind of go beep for you. Well, there you go. That's I think that answers that question. If totally satisfied customers are six times more likely to make a purchase than satisfied customers, then why do most corporations fall on this mark? Oh God, this is this is a two-hour response here. You know, totally satisfied customers getting a nine or a ten on a ten-point scale is actually pretty hard to do. You know, most people are going to signal us, "How satisfied are you?" Well, I'm pretty good. I'll be a seven, which means they're not satisfied. You know, it's only the nines and the tens that are completely satisfied. So. Firms have to over-promise, under-promise, and over-deliver to get to that 9 or 10. You know? The other thing is that you have to remember what most corporations do with satisfaction data. It's terrible. How many times have you guys gone to the car dealership, and as you go to the car dealership, the service manager is going, oh, by the way, in about a week or two, you're going to get a phone call or a survey in the mail, and they're going to ask you how satisfied you were. You know, my bonus and my family here is a function of my, you know, how satisfied you are. So when you get that question, you're going to answer a 10. Isn't that right? I mean, I've been to Toyota dealerships and I've been to Honda dealerships. And this has happened to me on more occasion than one, you know. So... Here, the company gets the satisfaction data back, and it's and it's bogus. It's not even real. It's it's it's. There's so much error in the data. So there's a lot of things that corporations do wrong with. First of all, the fact that they're collecting satisfaction data at all is not a good idea. And then how the data is collected is also not great. And then the number of questions. If you get a 25 question satisfaction survey, there's no reason to have a 25 question satisfaction survey. You know, you get survey fatigue. So there's other issues where companies, corporations do wrong. Okay, what other specific ways to measure customer satisfaction other than surveys? Um, you know, in a Web 2.0 world, 
you won't be able to measure it directly, but you can monitor social media listening to see what people are saying in Facebook and on Twitter. And you can gauge customer sentiment, either positive or negative, or extremely positive or extremely negative, you know. But uh, if anything, I want you guys to stop thinking about measuring customer satisfaction, you know. I don't think it's worth the effort. If you're going to spend time and effort measuring anything, measure loyalty. Who conducts these surveys? Outside research firms or the companies themselves? Yes and yes. I, I think it's a blend. It depends on the company. It depends on the situation. But a lot of companies do their own satisfaction research, and a lot of it's outsourced to marketing research firms. Um, again, I'm not a fan of customer satisfaction studies. Is the numerical system foolproof, and how can it be improved? To be honest with you, team, I mean, I know I'm... By the way, I cut and paste. I don't know... I cut out... I wanted to get as much as I can on one page. Um, there's not enough detail here for me to answer these questions. I'm not sure what we're referring to. So next time, see if you can give me like a complete sentence or a little more reference to. If you're referring to the bell-shaped curve and the fact that it's skewed, can we fix that? No, because it's human behavior is what's making it skewed. You feel bad giving someone, someone a zero or a one, so you give them a three or a four when you really mean zero. And people are always going to do that because you're kind of trying to be nice. Think about every time you go to a restaurant and the waiter comes over and say, how's everything? And you go, oh yeah, it's great. And you look at him and you look at your meal like, yeah, this is cold. Yeah, I don't feel like saying anything. Whatever. I'm just coming here to eat. I'm not coming back. You know, that's a problem. Next time, give me more detail than this, okay? Uh, in general, though, I'm much happier with the number of questions I had this week versus last week. I have six full pages here. Um, how can products that do not traditionally generate excitement live up to that final point? Well, not everything has to live up to excitement. But what it has to is it has to live up to expectation. You know, everything doesn't have to be a Disney trip. But if you go to a hotel stay at a Motel 6, it has to live up to the expectation of... Look, it's cheap, it's a room, it better be clean, and I need to go to sleep, and I can get out of here. You know, you send the signal. If you live up, if you live up to a, if you're, if consumers are expecting a certain expectation given this price point, you have to live up to that expectation. Good firms exceed expectations, you overpromise and underdeliver. How can companies ensure true customer loyalty? Well, you overpromise and you underdeliver. You know, you keep, my favorite expression, my, my definition of marketing is find out what people want and give it to them. And then one of my other favorite expressions is what's in it for me. If there's nothing in it for me, I'm not interested. Well, you increase loyalty or you maintain loyalty by constantly giving people the coupon or the product or the service that they truly love, that they truly want. And in a CRM world, when you have enough data, you know what people like and you know what people don't like. You know what they buy more of and you know what they don't buy more of. So give them what they want. What is the best way to deal with complaining customers? Listen, 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 listen. You may want to fire them. You may want to drop them and maybe that is the case, but you definitely should learn from them. My God, you should learn from them. This is marketing research. Complaining customers should be something that should be done out in the open. I'm a big fan of open communication there. What recommend, uh, What are recommended ways to satisfy e-business customers and keep them true customers? Gosh, the same thing as anything else. Overpromise and underdeliver. I mean, think back to Amazon. Amazon in 1997, 98, and 99 spent hundreds of millions of dollars creating the easiest, cleanest, friendliest user interface, also named as a UI, user interface, um, on the internet, to the point where they ended up creating a consulting business and helping other businesses help with their interface. Think about when you shop at Amazon. Is it a big deal? No, one click, done, pick this address, done. You know? 
I like to go to Amazon because I feel comfortable that they have my credit card. I know that they have everything that I could possibly want in there. I've had previous good experience with Amazon. Why wouldn't I just keep going back to Amazon? Question. The article speaks about loyalty programs as... Did I switch articles already? No. Uh, as loyalty programs is one way a customer is held hostage. Aren't these programs also something that keeps customers satisfied? Well, it depends. You know, there's some loyalty programs like frequent fire miles that really just keep consumers hostages. And there isn't really other than a free flight that these things offer. You know, um, Some companies call them loyalty programs and they do nothing but collect the data but don't give anything back in return. I mean, think about some of your supermarket cards. I mean, other than getting a discount at the register, what else are they really good for? Do they do anything else for you? I mean, it's one of the reasons why consumers are a little reluctant because not every marketer is as good as CVS or as good as Target with regards to the information that they collect and then give you back exactly what you want. Most of them just collect the data and then that's it. Would a customer who always picks the cheapest price never be considered completely satisfied? Even if they believe your product service is exceptional and recommend it. Or would it be only the way they're completely satisfied is it if they offered you the cheapest prices? That's a function on the customer and exactly what they want. I know customers and I have friends that all they care about is cheap, 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 whatever's the cheapest and saving the money. Quality's not the issue. Lasting's not the issue. Relationship's not the issue. They always want cheap. Well, if you can be an incredible value, meaning cheaper, yet have consistent quality or better than average quality, you have yourself a business. And this is what the Japanese manufacturers were in the 80s and the 90s with their automobiles. They had very good reliability, very good quality, and they had very good prices. So when the Japanese auto company started going up market, it's the South Koreans that moved into that. And if you look at Hyundai, Hyundai would be a very reliable car, at a very good price. And now in the last three, four years, Hyundai's been killing it because now the cars actually look really good. And the quality's almost on par with Honda and Toyota. And yet they're still like $1,500 or $2,000 cheaper. That's why they're gaining so much market share. Couldn't it be argued that customers who are completely satisfied are still prone to switching brands in certain purchasing situations? Sure. Uh, satisfaction is a bad measure. Just because you're completely satisfied doesn't mean you won't switch because the satisfaction measure doesn't measure if you would recommend or you would buy again, which is what loyalty measurements do. You know, you know, the lower the price and the lower involvement like gum and soda, sure, there's a lot of trial, there's a lot of impulse purchasing. But then again, you have some people that are Pepsi people and they won't drink a Coke even if it's free and even if they don't, there's nothing else to drink in that stadium. They'll go find a bottle of water somewhere or a water fountain. Complete satisfaction may be the key, but not fully black and white. Yeah. I want you guys to, I want you guys to, to, to flush satisfaction out of your brain. I don't think it's worth it. Loyalty. How likely would you recommend? How likely would you purchase again? Wouldn't it be tough to apply this completely satisfied standard throughout a national or global company? Well, there is no question that there's a lot of studies that international, particularly Asian populations, have a different idea of satisfaction and loyalty. The studies that we're talking about now were done in the U.S. with predominantly Western firms. Um, I don't have the answer to that, and I apologize. What's it take to completely satisfy a person in Jersey is probably different with regard to being positive in Ohio, right? No, I'm not sure about that. Uh, New Jersey and Ohio are significantly more, uh, more alike than New Jersey and Seoul or New Jersey and Shanghai or New Jersey and uh, Taipei. You know, individualistic cultures like the United States and most of Western Europe, no. Loyalty, satisfaction stuff doesn't work. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Article 2. 
Is loyalty all about word of mouth marketing free advertising? Uh, let me highlight this. I'm going to read it again. Is loyalty all about word of mouth marketing free advertising? No, it's not. I think word of mouth and free advertising is a bonus from loyalty. I think word of mouth marketing and free advertising is a, a reward for doing a really good job. Loyalty is about repeat purchase. Loyalty is about pro-social behavior. You know, I think this is, you know, loyalty more than anything means that someone's going to buy your product over another product. And it just so happens that they, they're such an apostle and not a terrorist that they do stuff such as pro-social word of mouth. And you get free advertising out of it. This is more after effect as opposed to what loyalty really is, which is actual repeat purchase and not switching. More questions. In which situation would the would recommend question on a survey not be highly correlated with loyalty and a predictive of growth? Well, you know, there's a lot of situations um, uh, and since this article was written in 2003 or 2001, I believe, you know, even though this was a pretty rigorous study, the academic geeks in the Journal of Marketing and the Journal of Marketing Research actually started tearing apart this item. You know, they wanted to see if it was in fact true, and um, they did get some confirmation, and they didn't. They got some other disconfirmation. What happens is, is sometimes on a first-time purchase even though you would probably recommend the metrics are not as strong it's sort of you know I'll freely admit this is an Apple computer we have two iPhones two iPads we have all Apple computer stuff in my house okay I've purchased a number of Apple products over the past 10 years I'm a situation where I'm an apostle or a zealot or whatever you want to call me but maybe a first-time Apple buyer of a phone or a computer, yeah, I would recommend, but they're not completely baked in yet. You know, they're not as crazy about the product I am. Um, other products like this, BMW, Mini, Harley-Davidson, of course. We'll read about Harley-Davidson later. If in other companies, if company surveys are not effective, why do they spend the time and money preparing them? Well... It depends. Uh, I'm not sure about this question, to be honest with you. Company surveys can be effective if they're constructed the right way and they ask the right questions. A lot of companies don't ask the right questions and they also lead you or, you know, they're not valid and they're not done in a rigorous manner. And then the data is not worth the paper that they're printed on. What are they doing with the customers who gave marginally good reviews but not the highest? Well, I hope that they're learning from those customers that are complaining and finding out why it's only marginally good. But not a whole hell of a lot, really. You're focusing on the nines and the tens, the net promoters, the high apostles, because those are the ones that are buying from you and probably are going to buy again from you and probably talking about your product to their friends and relatives. As a medium to high turnover market, how can Enterprise be sure that its customers are loyal? Even if their customers gave them exceptional reviews, they can also think th that highly of their competitors as well. Usually what happens is, is that when you get strong brand, strong brand equity, which eventually turns into loyalty, when it's time to do a search for something, you search less because you had a good experience. If you really like Enterprise and you use them a couple times, chances are you're not going to go back to square one and do price searches and see if, you know, okay, let's just check to see this time if Hertz is better than... No, 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 no. You're busy. You have other things to work on. You already have Enterprise locked into your head. So guess what? You go back to Enterprise. And then a market that's normally medium to high turnover becomes less high turnover because people keep coming back. Question, should you shift money from marketing to new customers in order to make current customers loyal 
who will do the marketing for you. How do you determine how much should be spent on each? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if it's about just shifting money, but I think that corporations should spend a significant more time on retention of existing customers. And whatever that might be, is it like a member night? Is it, you know, more coupons? Is it like a free product every now and then? Is it, um, you know, loyal customers only day two hours before the store opens where you get like first crack at 50% off everything? However, the company should decide to focus on loyal customers and retention. That's what they should do. With regards to a car salesman, why is it a negative thing that customers are always given a good score because of a low price? For some reason, isn't price their number one priority? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, for some people, they're searching only for low price. So that is their priority. They have no concept or idea that they may ever come back to this dealership again. They're just searching for price, 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 price. You know. I hope that answers your question. I don't know if I really got that one there. Are quantitative questions like this really the ultimate answer, or is it more qualitative research that companies perform that provide real insights? In terms of recommending a product to a friend, a company does not need to know yes, no. They need to know why, right? Well, I'm going to agree with you on some level. I'm a big fan of qualitative research, as a matter of fact, and I do more qualitative than quantitative. Qualitative is words. Qualitative is in-depth. Qualitatives are focus groups, personal interviews, the, and you do get deeper insights with qualitative. The hard part with qualitative is you can't quantify it. It's not generalizable to a large population. So usually what happens is, is qualitative is done when you need to explore, discover, uncover things. But if you want to confirm something, you have to do quantitative because it's the only thing that you can generalize to a large population and collect a ton of data at once. Qualitative is hard to do lots of focus groups. They take a lot of time, they take a lot of transcription of the words, and they take a lot of, uh, and they're not generalizable to a large population. You may ask one question with open-ended to 3,000 people, but then how do you tabulate the results? You have to read all 3,000, you have to code, okay, these are the positive ones, these are the negative ones, these are the people that have a problem. And then the information, you know, it's not as actionable. Qualitative is great for discovery-oriented research. Quantitative is great for confirmatory-oriented research. The net promoter score is a confirmatory question. But I think you get real insights out of both. You just do different things. What kind of role do social tools, tools such as cloud scores play in all this? Is this more of a way to impress one person from a, from a high school or three average people or <sighs> clout? I don't even know where to start here. You know, let me write a note to myself that I'll send you the clout link. Clout is not a net promoter score the way we talked about it in these articles. You know, because clout has more about what you say and how it affects other people. But it's not product specific or category specific. You know, um, I like this question. It's not directly related to our article. But I see kind of where you were going with that. I'm going to send everybody a link on clout and how clout calculates their scores and maybe a little video that you can watch. But uh, there's a couple different ones besides clout. Um, and I can see you're sort of thinking about that net promoter there, but that's not exactly what clout is. Based on the two articles, do you believe net promoter score number or share of wallet is more important? Um, I think they're both important. I think they're not the same thing. I think they're totally different ideas. You want someone to be so loyal that they have a high net promoter score. And of your customers that you have in your database, 
you want a very high share of wallet. I don't know if I can't say one's better than the other. They're, they're different things. I want them both. The authors of the share of wallet discount the net promoter number outlined it. Yeah, well, they had to discount it because they wanted to they wanted to tell an, the editor of the particular journal that yeah, the, our article is different than the net promoter score. Um, the net promoter score is significantly more common. Share of wallet is significantly more difficult to calculate and share of wallet requires you to know that much more about the customer. Net promoter score is only a single item. Once this one is certainly easier to calculate and measure and collect than this one. Um, what are the principles the loyalty leader should apply? All right. Uh, this is a question that's extremely broad. I don't even know where to start here. Um, but given what's going to come up in the next two weeks in our articles, retain your existing customers, tell them what's in it for them, and get them to buy more from you more frequently. Getting more customers to become net promoters makes sense, but this article suggests that marketing efforts should be focused on keeping the most loyal customers happy. How can you be sure that marketing efforts aren't going to waste in this case? What if these customers would stay happy anyway? Well, do the research. Here's an, an excellent example where qualitative, where you would have to go in depth to find out whether you're wasting your marketing dollars or not. You know, but I'm all I'm a big fan of spending money to keep people happy. You know. If you ask me, could this system be used to determine which customers a company should or should not focus on efforts on? Well, yeah, you're only focusing on items and people who are nine and ten. You know, we're going to see other articles, perhaps this semester, where it's going to show how much expensive it is for a marketer to persuade someone with a six or a seven to move up to become a nine or a ten. It may not be worth it at all. You know, where's the cutoff? The cutoff is extremely skewed to the super high end. On a five point scale, it's five. On a 10 point scale, it's a nine or a 10. It's the top 85, you know, it's the 85th percentile and higher. Isn't linking manager pay or promotions at risky? What if regional factors, you know? Well, you could say, there are norms. You could say that people down south are more polite. You can say that people in California are more forgiving. You know, there's no question that if you keep collecting the data and you keep collecting it over time, you may see regional differences. But at the same time, if you switch a manager out of New York and all of a sudden the scores start trending in a different direction, it has more to do with the manager of that particular branch of enterprise than anything else. The more data you have, the more consistent you collect it, the more over time, the better you're able to tease some of this out. Why is the general manager or the CFO the better person to be responsible for the process than the marketing department? Um, he said that in the article? To be honest with you, I don't remember this at all. I, I'm a fan of the general manager and the CFO being involved in the process and in a market-oriented firm everybody's involved in everything but I don't think the CFO necessarily has to be the one collecting this data if you want to re-ask that question back to me in an email I'll, I'll see if I can get to it if consumers become your most cost-effective marketing department are there ways to incentivize their recommendations to fellow consumers beyond the net promoter stage sure you can bribe them but that's really not what you want to do because then you're spending money to create fake loyalty not even false or, or forced you know hey look you know if you take care of this it, it's not sincere it's gonna you, you're gonna be able to read through a friend or a family member whether a recommendation is sincere or not because they're not getting anything or you know you could tell that you know they got something they're only saying it because they got something they're not saying it in your behalf. They're saying it because of their behalf. It doesn't work that well. If you do a really good job with someone, they'll recommend you without you having to bribe them. But if you're not doing a good job, you're probably going to have to bribe them for them to do any blah, 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 blah. You know? 
How can a firm convert its detractors into net promoters? Does this operation need a big investment? It needs a huge investment, and I don't suggest you should do it at all. I hinted at this a couple questions above. It is, sign it is two to three times more expensive to move to attract a seven or a six to move them to a nine than it is an eight to a nine. You know, it's not worth it. It's really not worth it. Next article, when every customer is a new customer. I like this article. This is a different kind of an article. It made, you know, especially compared to when we think about satisfaction and net loyalty. And that's why it's included in the, in the bunch. Can a business be truly successful without returning customers? Um, perhaps. Um, I, think it's, I think it's much more challenging. It's significantly more expensive to always go out and find new customers. Attracting customers, persuading them to buy. Think about you guys. Finding a new customer takes a lot more time, energy, and resources than it does to service an existing customer and get them to buy again. Yeah. What is the relationship between high turnover customers and truly loyal customers? I would say that the relationship is completely inversed. You know, high turnover customers are ones that are not loyal. They're searching for deal, bargain, variety seeking. And these people are, if they're high turnover customers, then guess what? Let them turn over and bother someone else. Focus on your loyal, cust loyal, loyal customers. Do all companies use TNR when establishing turnover ratio? Um, no. As a matter of fact, not everybody is establishing a turnover ratio and some companies are not even other than looking what the turnover ratio is they're spending more time and energy trying to make the loyal customers happy i'm not sure what other methods are out there to be honest with you because this is actually i like this article but this is not a dominant conversation i'm, I'm sure this is probably something that was very new to you regardless of what business you're in I'm not familiar with that many other methods that are out there, to be honest with you. How can pharmaceutical sales rate reps penetrate the acute disease market when doctors have so much influence on what drugs to prescribe? Well, the hard, side, the hard part of being a pharma rep is you never close any deals. You know, that's not the way the pharma industry is set up. You don't get to go through all steps in the sales process because after you do your presentation, you can't do a hard close because the doctor turns around and gives you, oh, yeah, yeah, this is great. I'm going to do scripts for you. No problem. And then you go back to your IRI data three weeks later and you go, this guy hasn't wrote one script for me yet. You know, so you need to figure out, depending on the doctor, and depending on the market, and depending on who your competition is, what's the message that you're going to tell the doctor what's in it for them? I mean, if your drug is not superior than what else is out there, then you have a very, very tall mountain to climb up. You know, and that's really what's happening in pharma right now. The drugs out there, you know, there's three or four drugs all doing the same acute disease, and they're not really all that different from each other. So then it comes down to whether they like the salesperson or not. Or whether they like the company that, you know, they have some kind of a relationship with the pharma company from previous years. Uh, this is a, this, look, I have a lot of experience in pharma sales stuff. If you want to talk to me offline more about this specifically. Um, but this is difficult because pharma sales people don't close the deal. And you have to go back and then talk to the doctor. Hey, how you doing? You're not writing me any scripts, you know. Is it possible to turn a market with a high turnover rate into one without one? Uh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And I don't think there's a fast or quick and easy way to do. Could the entire market shift to maybe a subscription based from a, you know, from a non-subscription based marketplace? I mean, think of the cell phone market. Okay. Uh, there's some forced loyalty in here because you sign it to your contract. So then you reduce the turnover because guess what? People are locked into a contract. Uh, could you get away with that? Perhaps. Perhaps. It depends on the situation. 
How do you accurately determine the number of customers entering and exit of marketing? Hopefully you buy the data from Nielsen or IRI. You know, hopefully you're in an industry where you have a trade group that's telling you the customer population. Hopefully you have partners like Target and CVS and Walmart that share their data. Hopefully. Is it better to be in a high turnover market with good growth or a low turnover market with stagnant growth? Which market is more risky? Uh, it's, it's, in my opinion, I'd rather be in a low turnover market with low growth if I am the market share leader and my margins are 40%. You know, If you're in a high turnover market and your margins are 2%, I don't care about the growth. You know, there's a lot more variables in this question that I would look into. It's not just growth or whether it's good or stagnant. It's also how much margin you have in the product and whether you're the market share leader or you're the fourth player in the market with 5% market share. If you're in 5% market share and you're in a low turnover market with stagnant growth, and you're the number four player in that marketplace. Sell the business and go to another go to another market. You know, let the number three player take your market share and merge number three and four and, and exit. Take the cash and run. How effective can alumni records for a company be for product when tapped into social media? Uh, it could be massively effective. You know, if you look at the Fortune 500, this is true that there are more GE alumni in the Fortune 500 than any other Fortune 500 firm. It's not an accident because no one trains like GE trains. So alumni, the idea of alumni is a spectacular thing that I think more companies should take that concept of alumni or trying to retain your previous customers. You know, I don't even think universities do a strong enough job with their alumni with regards to getting additional education resource money from them, getting donations from them, getting them involved, just coming to campus to look at student interviews or help them find jobs. You know, this could solve a lot of problems. Question. How can you provide incentives for customers that have cycled through your market to promote your product when used it had been exhausted? Well, you could be a company that they cycle through your product, but then you have another product for them. So that's the part of the article where they were talking about stages. You know, you, a former bride becomes a wife, but a wife without kids is a different than a wife with kids. And a wife with kids and toddlers is different than a wife with kid, a family. Let me not say wife. You know, we have stages, and what happens is, is a company could create products for the stages. You know, you may attract them as they become a bride, and then they become a homeowner and a wife, and then they're part of a family unit with small kids, and a family unit with toddlers, and a family unit with children in elementary school create products and services for each stage where people are at you know and then eventually you get into retirement stuff and we all die sorry to be morbid is entering into a high turnover company easier than entering into a low turnover company are barriers still entry to high and high since company loyals and social care um that's a good question I think it's easier for companies to get into high turnover type scenarios because there isn't so much loyalty. People have that variety seeking behavior or it's a product or service that's low cost with a lot of uh, a lot of switching type behavior. You know, it could be the fact that convenience is the deciding factor. So if you get your product with better shelf placement and all the Wawa's and 7-Elevens of the world, then guess what? You're going to get higher market share. How often does a high turnover industry turn into a low turnover industry? Uh, not very often at all. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head and I can't think of one. High turnover industry turn into a low turnover industry. Mm, no. I mean, sometimes when we talk about the stages, the product stages, introduction, growth, maturity, and decline, you know, 
it's much more turnover in the introduction and growth when there's a lot of players and people are checking things out. But when you get into the cash cow maturity and decline, there's not that much turnover there. I hope that helps. How important is it for a company in a high turnover industry to be social? It depends. It depends on the goal of the firm. It depends on what the company wants to accomplish. Maybe the social and the bonds that are created through social help reduce turnover, perhaps. By the time a relationship is cultivated or a bad experience is corrected, the relationship may be over. It could be. But every business could be monitoring Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and, and, and uh, Tumblr to see what people are saying and to make corrections. You know. How would you rank the purchasing criteria for consumers in a high turnover industry? How would I rank them? Um, I would need more information. I need, would need to know the industry, how, how many players there are in that particular industry, how strong each individual brand is in that individual industry. Um, that plays more into you know, how much shelf space does one brand have versus the other. You know, Dr. Pepper has been trying to you know, beat up either Pepsi or Coke for what, 25, 30 years, and it's a shelf positioning battle. They don't have the marketing dollars in the supermarket to buy the end caps, which are very expensive, where Pepsi and Coke get all those additional sales. Next article, customer loyalty isn't enough. Grow your share of wallet. I thought this was a pretty neat article. Make sure. I like this concept, this share of wallet concept. Why doesn't customer satisfaction alone keep a customer from buying from competitors? Um, as I mentioned previously, customer satisfaction is a measure of past behavior, not future behavior. All you know is that a previous purchase experience was satisfactory, but you do not know whether that previous satisfaction is going to translate into future behavior. That's why the loyalty measurements are better. What is the best way to keep track of your company's wallet score and the competitors? Um, what is the best way? Yeah, in a CRM database, like a Salesforce kind of a type scenario. Or, um, or go to one of the monster database companies such as Axiom. Axiom. You know, find out. Get their, pull their credit card, pull their credit score, and pull their credit card spending and Take a peek. Wallet allocation rule. To be honest with you, I don't know what that is. Maybe I'll... Let me take a quick peek. Let me see if I can find it real quick. So I'm on the bottom of page 30. Let me read real quick. The rank that the customer assigns... Page 30, left-hand column, bottom left. The rank that a customer assigns to a brand relative to the other brands they use to predict share of wallet according to a simple previously unknown formula, which we've named the wallet allocation rule. From company and industry to industry, the correlation between a brand's wallet allocation rule score and its share of wallet was remarkably consistent. So basically, think of it as a brand equity score. You know, if we look at the smartphone market, you know, Apple and Samsung have the highest wallet allocation score. And no, not surprise, you know, these are the only two profitable smartphones in the entire industry. Nokia's not. Blackberry's not. Um, LG is not. Sony Ericsson's not. You know, I hope that was helpful. How hard is it for a company to invest and cross the bar board in superior business units? Very difficult. As a matter of fact, that you know, some companies don't have superior business units across all units. Some divisions may be number one in the industry, and some divisions aren't. I mean, look at Apple, who's supposedly a very good company, but their computers, you know, they're not the market share leader. They are in iPods, but is iPods really that great of an industry? Music players, they don't, you know. So. I don't see across the board investing in superior units. You tend to ride your fastest or strongest horse. You know. Should a company take its weakest and bring in merely the industry average first to see how consumers would react before going in all? 
uh, I don't like to do anything half-assed. I don't like to, I don't like to dip my toe in the market to see how things would go. I'm an all-in kind of a guy, you know. Especially if you have, you know, the notion of being in the industry long term. Where did this focus on share of wallet come from? Is there a particular pioneer in this area? Um, I don't know if there's a particular pioneer in this area, but this was the only article that I that I this ever came to me. Now, share of wallet. You know, this concept of trying to get all the market share of something, I mean, if you look at the professional selling literature, there's market penetration, you know. If you're Xerox and we look at the Silt Seton Hall University and we have copiers in the law school and we have copiers in the business school, well, we don't have great penetration because there's no copiers in the Whitehead School of Management. There's no copiers in any of the arts and science colleges. There's no copiers in the nursing. So... Share of wallet, Coke calls it share of stomach, we call it market penetration. You know, the concept's been kind of around, but the actual term share of wallet, I think might be unique to this article. Some of these seem abstract. What specific steps should a company actually take to make their share of wallet higher? Well, increase their brand recognition. If you got higher brand equity and people know more about your brand and you, you have higher brand quality and people say more positive things about your brand, you're going to have a higher wallet allocation score. Are customer loyalty and retention going to be soon metrics of the past? Uh, hell no. No. Write that down. No. What else could there be? What else would it be? You know, there's nothing better than loyalty. There's nothing better than repeat purchase. I, I really don't see a scenario where loyalty and retention are going to disappear. Now, lower involvement, you know, bubblegum, okay, there's not that much retention going on. But there might be more loyalty going on. We're going to get, I want you to bank this one. Instead of thinking of metrics, in the next two weeks, we're going to read a lot about these two things in the CRM articles. Let's come back to this question. I think the answer is no. How can a firm improve its rank? Uh, I think I answered this. Better brand equity share of wallet score. Um, is there any chance you will lose your differentiation by trying to match competitors in what they will do to capture more share of wallet? How do you balance differentiation strategy and capturing as much share as wallet as possible? Well, Directly benchmarking your competition and meeting the competition only gets you so far because innovation is the name of the game and everybody always takes another step forward. You should be able to benchmark against your competition but at the same time clearly send a signal to the customers out there how you are different vis-a-vis -vis all the other players in the marketplace. You need differentiation, otherwise you're going to have a hard time gaining that brand equity that would give you the share of wallet. Is this strategy widely used by large corporations? Um, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that corporations talk about it more than they actually do it. They do focus on loyalty, they do focus on retention, but I don't think calculating share of wallet is actually quite challenging. It's significantly more difficult than calculating the net promoter score. That's only a single item. And loyalty, um, how likely are you to repurchase again in the next three weeks? That's a single item. Share of wallet's not a single item. Is this strategy, oh, I read that. What are the best ways to think, way, best ways a company can prevent cannibalization from other companies trying to improve their rank. Well, cannibalization is when a company does that to themselves. Other companies definitionally can't cannibalize you. All right. Other companies can outperform you. Other companies can steal market share from you. Other companies can steal business from you. What are the best ways can you do... Um, I don't know if I can directly answer this question um, over promise and under deliver. I keep saying stuff like that. Having higher quality, having a better price given the quality levels out there. I mean, that's kind of where my head would be at with this. Our last article, Twitter. Let's see what kind of Twitter questions we have. Early bird catches the worm. Microblogging. 
What are some of the best drivers to get your consumers to be actively pushing information and not just pulling information? So if I were to reword this, how do you get your customers to forward messages um, in Twitter or a microblog? Hold that thought. Perhaps some of you who haven't picked a book yet should pick this one. Contagious, Why Things Catch On, Jonah Berger, probably one of the top 10 business books of the year. He's a Wharton professor. This is the answer to this question. It has to make, the person has to want to do it because it does something for them. They'll forward information on Twitter if it makes them look smart. They'll forward information on Twitter if there's some kind of reward for forwarding information on Twitter. There's a number of different things that you can, you know, motivations to why someone would be actively pushing information and not just pulling. Get the book. It's a very good one. Where do you think Twitter will go next? Um, that is a great question. I think Twitter is moving in the direction of more of a micro blog to more of a social network. They're trying to go in that direction. But, you know, it's IPO time. You know, they're in their quiet period. I can't wait to read that S1. I know I have more questions about that, so I'm going to hold off on that for a moment. They're moving in the direction of more social networking than just microblog. How can companies best make the use of such an application without giving the impression that they're monitoring all their customers and trying to brainwash those who might have hold the negative opinion of the firm? Um... Okay. I don't even know where to start with this one. How can customers, companies best make use of Twitter without giving the impression that they're monitoring all their customers? All right, let's stop right there. I'm going to ignore the brainwash one, you know, because I know what you're trying to say. We're just, we're, you know, the fact that they keep pushing information and pushing tweets out at you. Um, but... If you're on social media, everything that's said on social media is being monitored. You know. And the ones that have a negative sentiment about the firm, you know, companies do this as sort of a marketing research function to see what people are complaining about. A lot of people are upset with Apple right now because of the lines and which phones are available and not available and how much these damn things cost. You know? The piece says that 80% of accounts should be considered inactive. Why? What are the criteria for can be considered inactive? Well, if you do a couple of Google searches on Twitter, um, and I'm dying to see what's in the S1, to be honest with you, I'm really busy right now. You know? Um, Leo, I don't have money. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. That's my little guy. All right. Twitter does not do a great job of defining what a Twitter user is. If you downloaded the application and you signed up for an account and you've had it for six months and you've never tweeted, are you an active user? If you log on to Twitter every day and look at your feed but you've never tweet, are you an active user? You know, if you downloaded Twitter, followed a bunch of people, and never go into it anymore, are you active or inactive? Um, Twitter's avoided all definitions of what exactly an active user is. And then what they happen is, is they say, you know, 250 million people log into Twitter at least once a month. Twitter's one of these social networks that you have really, really heavy users and then you have some light users. You know. But it is true that the majority of the people follow without tweeting. It's, you know, uh, you could Google this. It's somewhere in the relationship of uh, 5%, somewhere around 5% of people on Twitter are responsible for 95% of all the tweets. Something along those lines. 
Uh, the piece also says that the median number of lifetime tweets per user is one. Does this include business Twitter accounts or only personal accounts? It's primarily personal accounts. Because businesses, you know, if they're, if they're on Twitter and they want to use Twitter, they just schedule them. You use a software package. They send one out every hour or two a day. Zappos asked new recruits to tweet something during training to let employees know everyone in the company can act as a spokesperson. Isn't this risky? Why wouldn't they want just anyone being a spokesperson? Well, this Zappos is a different kind of a company, and this is cultural to the firm of Zappos. Zappos is not very hierarchical. It's a very flat organization, and it's a customer service oriented company. They want everybody who works for Zappos to be in customer service, either directly or indirectly. And you can be indirectly involved with customer service at Zappos on Twitter. Why do most people observe rather than tweet? Well, it's hard to tweet, actually. It's awkward to tweet. And some people don't, you know, it's... They have a concept of a magazine or a newspaper, and you go to find the most current information, but they just want to know what Kim Kardashian's doing, but they don't need to say anything to her. Right? Questions. How do consumers view services that can look through tweets and delete ones they feel are inappropriate? Um, this is really... And there are multiple scenarios. Go on the Google and type deleted tweet and you'll see, you know, very rarely that anything that gets deleted is completely deleted. And anytime a, cons a company tries to remove a tweet or remove something from their blog, chances are someone has a screen capture of it and it still blows up all over the internet. The crowd, wisdom of crowds, we'll get to that, um, is very active in these social networks and they rebel against scenarios like this. Is microblogging just a fad or something that seems here to stay? I don't think it's a fad at all. If it was a fad, it would have died before 2008, 2009, and 2010. Twitter started in 2006. The first tweet was 2006. It wasn't really until 2008 where people started paying attention. Um, you know, if, if I were to pick one social network, I would pick LinkedIn because that's what I like the most. But LinkedIn and Twitter are the two I use the most. You know, because one is a social network and one is for immediacy. You know, I don't think there's a better immediacy anything in, in the social networking world other than Twitter. I don't, it's not going anywhere. How is Twitter pending IPO going to alter its business model? Uh, here, I'll highlight it. Let's make it bigger. I'm still not convinced they have a business model. That's why I need to read the S1. I know that all these Web 2.0 firms that go to their IPO and go public and they only have a single revenue stream, and in Twitter's case it's advertising, struggle. Pandora struggles. Zenga struggles. Groupon struggles. Um, Facebook doesn't struggle because they're shifting more into mobile, so they have two revenue streams, plus they're the biggest fish in the pond. So they have a little... You know, but Twitter is not the biggest fish in the pond. Groupon is not the biggest fish in the pond. How would one think traditional revenue streams would be explored? You know, I think Twitter should do more what Google does with regards to search. You know, Twitter, Twitter should be more of a search engine like beyond the just a straight feed. And the feed is really an awkward way to stay on top of things. You know, there's got to be a better way visually and graphically to look at your feed. Because otherwise, it's just this long stream and you miss everything. Uh, they're going to keep talking. You, you're going to keep in the business press. They keep talking about native or in stream ads. Um, still ads. Why do we continually see companies who just don't understand how to leverage and utilize social media? Because social media is the wild, wild west. And, you know, if we talk about market orientation, we have 30 years of literature on market orientation and strategy and how market orientation works and how it doesn't work. We have scales, metrics, case studies, companies. We have history. We don't have any history with social media. 
everybody's it's like spaghetti. you're throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks and some people are paying attention to what sticks and a lot of people are not so everybody's just throwing spaghetti against the wall and not realizing hey look that guy over there did something and that really works there's very little benchmarking happening in social media there's very few people who really know what they're doing does tumblr play a legitimate role in microblogging even though it doesn't have the immediacy availability of a twitter well Tumblr is not as does not have the same immediacy as Twitter, but Tumblr is more immediate than a blog such as a WordPress blog. Like I have a WordPress blog, Dig Nuggetville. You know, if you look at them from immediacy and you want to do a continuum, blog on one side, Twitter on the other side, and you put Tumblr in the middle. You know, it is microblog like. It's just not as immediate as Twitter. Will microblogging be the primary way relevant content is consumed in the future with growth in mobile? Um, I feel very uncomfortable saying it will be the primary way. It will be one of the major ways. But I, you know, I'm very impressed with how Facebook's mor morphing itself. And there's going to be other stuff that'll be out there. Um, but I will agree that the future is mobile and everything's mobile. You know, the iPad, our, I have this monster beautiful desktop. And this is the equivalent of having a gigantic pickup truck. If you need to tow a boat or maybe you work in an industry that you need a truck, construction, great. Outside of that, you know, the new iPhone has a 64-bit chip in it that's powerful than the desktop computer that I have downstairs. So the mobile is going to be everything. This is going to be your desktop computer. And you'll have a Bluetooth keyboard with it. And you come home and your monitor fires up. And this is going to be your brain. And you're going to take it everywhere with you. It's that powerful. If it's not this, it'll be your iPad. Those tablet computers are powerful enough. Everybody doesn't need a truck anymore. That's why we have small cars and mid-sized cars and big cars and trucks and SUVs and all that other stuff. That's what's going to happen. How can a company with a limited marketing budget only use microblocking to measure customer wallet share retention or other marketing measures such as an industry? Well, the upside, if they have a limited marketing budget, social media is extremely cost-effective. You know, you could have an audience that follows you and you only market to your audience. There's your retention. The people that follow you, you know, those are the people that are most interested. And hopefully you're getting a larger share of their spending dollars wallet. You know, and we can measure this through, you could put something out on Twitter that links to Amazon where they actually purchase and you'll be able to follow all those metrics. You know, I'm a big fan of it to be honest with you. Well, microblogging morph into another social media phenomenon. It's already a social media phenomenon that's well documented. It doesn't need to morph any more than it already is. There are very few things that are bigger than Twitter, period. Do you feel that the Twitter IPO will perform the same way Facebook's did? Absolutely not. Mainly because Facebook did an extremely poor job courting the Wall Street crowd. Horrible job. And Facebook's, the mechanics of, I'm trying to remember the company that actually did theirs, they screwed up royally. The day of the IPO um, really did not go all that well. And even the days after. Mechanically, Wall Street wise, it was p done very poorly. Twitter will not make those same mistakes. They'll court Wall Street better than Zuckerberg did. And there's no way they're going to do the same mistakes mechanically that Facebook did. I can't remember what investment firms they, they used, but they're not going to, it's not going to happen. Why would Twitter's business now, do you mean perform as in the way the stock did? Okay. Um, Twitter, I doubt very much is going to start at $40 a share. Facebook really started way too high. I can't believe it. Did they start at $30 a share or $40 a share? I mean, it took them an entire year to get back to their IPO price. So I think it was $40 a share. If Twitter's smart, they should, you know, under promise and over deliver. Start at $15 or $20 a share and see where the market takes it. That's what I would do. 
In some ways, Facebook didn't care what happened because everybody bought the first day all the shares at $40 a share. Who cares what happens the second day? Facebook got all their cash, but that's more Wall Street stuff. Why would Twitter's business model be better than Facebook's if they both rely on advertising, which drives users away? Um, Facebook has more revenue streams. Twitter only has advertising. Facebook has gifts. They still still get some virtual. They have the Facebook, you know, money. They have gifts that you can buy. Facebook is doing different ways to create revenue stream. And Facebook has a desktop and a mobile revenue stream. Twitter only has primarily a mobile revenue stream, and they only have ads. Facebook has a stronger business model, even though it's not great. Do microblogs like Twitter create too much noise for messages to be effective? Yes, 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 and yes. Should marketing communications managers be concerned with the messages are being lost among the enormity of tweets? Yes, they should be. And what they should do more of is maybe the company is not tweeting in their behalf, but just like a celebrity endorsement, if you get Kim Kardashian to tweet for you, if you get Justin Bieber to tweet for you, if you get Lady Gaga to tweet for you, that's significantly more effective in how you can cut through the, the clutter, have more impact. And our last set of questions. What has been some of the most effective recent examples of microblogging marketing? How can a company break through the clutter using Twitter's feed? I think I just answered the second half of that question. What is the most commonly used metric for Twitter success? Um, I don't know what the most commonly used metric is for Twitter success. You know something? I apologize, but not only am I out of breath, but I also don't have the answer to that. I mean, you want influence. So retweets, likes, and shares are the obvious metrics that Twitters are looking for. But um, the more someone retweets something, and Twitter does have a metric that, you know, let's say you have 200 followers, and one of your followers has 500 followers. If you tweet something that then is retweeted by one of your followers, that is then retweeted by someone that is not following you, they call, I'm trying to remember exactly how they call that. They get that has a much stronger influence because you're influencing someone that's not directly following you. You know, it doesn't directly answer your question. What has been some of the most effective recent examples of microblogging marketing success? I'll give you one, and it's one that I keep coming back to, and this is American Express, and they did a promo with uh, Jay Z earlier this year. And what happens is, is American Express did a very big campaign where they get your credit card and they have your credit, you link your Twitter account with your credit card account. Just like when you go on to American Express and you check your bill online, you then have the ability to link your Twitter account to that. So American Express can tweet out, hey, American Express users, I have Jay-Z tickets. Would you like so? And they have a little code that if you tweet them and they tweet back at you and then you tweet back again, it's like a confirmation, you just purchase the tickets because they have your credit card on file. It was a, the, the tweet was a particular deal and you bought that deal by retweeting it back at them. It's like confirming. Yes, I want this deal. So let me re let me rephrase how that goes. American Express sends me an offer for Eric Clapton tickets. I say, yes, American Express. I tweet back. I want Eric Clapton tickets. They confirm back to me. These are your Eric Clapton tickets. I tweet back and say, yes, I am now purchasing them. It's a done deal. They make the transaction on your credit card. That is a very neat microblogging thing. Very neat. Perhaps the best way to end at the moment. Thank you for your time. I appreciate all your questions. This was six pages of questions. It might have went longer than I expected. But I think at least this was a hell of a lot more organized than the first time I did it. Say yes. Thank you.